Hi, I'm here at the Ashburton Aviation Museum, located in Ashburton of the South Island of New Zealand, and I'm here inside their very own flight simulator. A couple of years ago, Boeing was developing a brand new aeroplane called the 737 MAX. That MAX is very important. You see, Boeing for many years had the 737 and they still fly today, an incredibly reliable aircraft. But Boeing wanted to make what was good even better. They wanted to make the 737 even more fuel efficient to make it a better proposition for airlines, for passengers, for everybody. And so they started work on how to make this plane more fuel efficient. Their idea was to fit a brand new engine that they had developed to this aeroplane, which would give it the same power and would allow it to be flying in a far more fuel efficient manner. There was only one issue with the engine. These new engines were larger and forced them to be closer to the ground. So close in fact, that it wouldn't be safe during takeoff. So Boeing needed a solution. They decided to get the engine and to move it further up the wing and make it a little bit higher as well. And by doing that, give it the clearance it needed for when it was taking off. However, when Boeing then took a model of the plane that they were developing and put it into a wind tunnel, started testing the aeroplane in simulators, not totally unlike this one, they discovered something quite unusual about the way that the plane now handled. Rather than it being just the same as it was before, when the aeroplane was doing steep maneuvers, especially climbing, they found that the nose had this tendency to pitch up. What it meant was that the Boeing's new aircraft or the improvement on their very reliable aircraft now handled slightly differently. You might say it's the same between driving a hatchback and a school bus. They're both vehicles, but they both handle very differently. Boeing needed the plane to handle in a similar way, however, so that pilots wouldn't be forced to get new licenses for this aeroplane. It was a big part of the selling deal. Anyway, Boeing thought about it and decided what could they do. They kept playing, but eventually came up with a quite clever piece of software, they thought, that they put into the aeroplane. This software was designed to when the nose would naturally pitch up, it was designed to counteract that movement so that a pilot would never even notice that it was happening. And so the experience of flying the plane would be very similar to the experience of flying the old model. The only problem was, and we've all, we all know the stories now, many of us have heard them, in uh, late 2018 and uh, early 2019, two of these brand new Boeing 737 MAX aircraft tragically crashed. The problem, this software, this software, as the pilots were trying to pull the nose up, the software, which was supposed to make something easier, instead was pushing the nose down. And because they weren't familiar with it, because they didn't understand it, because some of them didn't even know it was there, instead of being able to take the plane off and to keep the plane level, the result of this software that was supposed to help was that it pushed the planes into the ground and it ended in catastrophe. It's interesting that you and I, the Bible says, have something inside of us that's just the same. We have this hidden piece in us, this hidden part that perhaps some of us expect to help, but the Bible says it's anything but. Instead, when we try to fight our way out of a problem that we're experiencing, this, this piece in us, it pushes us down into the ground as well. Today, I want you to open your Bibles with me. We're going to be looking in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 7, verses 15, and a few verses afterwards, to explore what it is the Bible says is this part in us that makes us do the very thing we don't want to do. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, 
but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Can I ask you to give those verses, the ones that we've just read together, let them be personal to you. Put yourself into those verses. Make them colorful, put color into them. People, places, think of situations, think of times where you yourself were in that very situation where you didn't want to do something or you wanted to do something and you didn't find the power to not do it or to do it. You know you've been there. You know you've found yourself in exactly that kind of situation. The truth is all of us have found ourselves in situations like this because the verses we just read, this is not deep philosophy. This is not religion. This is human experience. This is something we all know and have felt ourselves in our humanness. There's three different approaches to these verses though. You can approach them from three very different ways. One of these ways I don't find too helpful at all. And the other two, one is okay, but one is definitely the best. And I'd love to share those with you now. The first approach to this, these verses is to look at them and say, look, it's not a problem. You're feeling bad for no reason. This struggle you feel within yourself, this fight that you're trying to wage within, that you're just not winning, the reason you're losing is because it's not a fight you were ever supposed to fight. There's no real struggle. The guilt, the shame, these are imposed upon you. These are man-made. This is from society. This is from religion. You don't need to feel the way you do. You just need to let go, let it wash over you. Just relax, chill out. It's not a problem. You know, some of us might think that's a very modern thought. We might think that, hey, that's the way modern people think and feel about feeling bad. But would it surprise you if I told you that this is not a modern thought at all? This, in fact, was one of the very first thoughts introduced to the human race, the Bible says, way back in the book of Genesis. Let's take a look now at Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Notice the serpent's words to the woman. He's basically telling her that what she thinks she needs to do or what she's been told she should do isn't a problem at all. In fact, he tells her the opposite. He goes, you know what? Just do what you want to do. Just do that very thing that your heart desires. Don't worry about consequences. In fact, the consequences will be fantastic. There'll be more freedom. There'll be more good that comes out of doing what you want to do, what your heart naturally seeks and desires. We know though how this story ends and it doesn't end well at all. That's the problem with doing what you want. You think you're going to get a result. Others might promise you a result, but the end result is the last thing you usually want. Another interesting thought behind doing what you want is this, that many people, not people of faith, not people who want to live by any moral standard, also explain that they too struggle to do what they want to do. Because of that, we have to acknowledge that at the bottom layer of this struggle is not just a moral struggle, it's a very human struggle. All of us, at one way or another, struggle to do the things that we want. That being the case, that leaves us with two other ways of approaching Romans 7. These two ways are quite similar in many ways. They both suggest that Romans 7 is speaking about a situation in which God does have a way for us, us to live. It talks about a way in which there is a struggle and that we need to fight that struggle. But the starting place for that struggle in these two approaches is totally different. The first of these two ways says this. It says that the person in Romans 7, the person that we're listening to in the verses, who's describing the struggle, is someone who 
knows God or knows about God or is interested in God, but who hasn't yet made that full commitment. You could say that they're, in Christian language, unconverted. They haven't made a full commitment of themselves over to Christ and his teachings. They haven't really made a commitment. They're not 100% sure where they stand, but they definitely think there's something to it. The other approach is similar. It also recognizes that the person has made this commitment, that they want to do God's will and God's ways. But here's the key difference. This approach says that this person, in fact, has made a full commitment to God. This person does want to live their life in all of its fullness with God. And yet, even when we live in this way, even when we've made a full commitment to God, there exists within us a struggle that we have to keep on fighting and we have to keep on wrestling with each and every day. Now, when I was younger, in my younger days, I was very much of the first of these two approaches. I believed that if I just applied my mind enough and if I focused, that I could, you know, get it right, that I wouldn't have the struggle within myself, that the temptations and the, the propensity to want to do things that I shouldn't would go away. I believe that people who had this struggle within themselves still must just be people who haven't yet fully given themselves over, people who have sold out, people who haven't applied themselves, you know, those kind of thoughts. It's been interesting though that over the years, as I've continued to live my Christian life, however, that I've experienced something. And it's why today I see this second view being the one that I think Romans 7 is speaking to. I see Romans 7 as my experience. And it's the experience of all of the Christian people that I know today. Now, someone says here, Ben, experience is not enough. We have to test it by the word of God. And I agree with you totally. Our experience alone is not enough, but it can be so informative when it comes to being able to interpret what the scriptures mean. Take David in the Psalms, in Psalms 119, verse 71. Listen to these words. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. What the psalmist is saying is, is that the experiences that they have had have informed them. They've, they've shown them things about God and about life. And through those experiences, they've learned what God is trying to tell them. See, that's what I love about Romans 7. Romans 7 is telling us something that we know is real because we all struggle. We've felt that struggle, we've experienced it ourselves. So when we see it described there in black and white on the page, we know it's telling us the truth about ourselves. And as a side note as well, over the years, I've known many Christian people. I've known many people that have thought that the struggle is not something that they should have to experience. And so they fight tooth and nail. They do all that they can to not experience that struggle. And after years and years and years, of discovering that they continue to struggle and becoming so dismayed that the very people that they thought they are not, they are. Instead of living with the struggle, they give up altogether. And that's the last thing we wanna do. Call me pragmatic, call me too practical, but I intend to go on with God. So if we accept this view of Romans 7, what are we trying to say? Well, many years ago, my wife introduced me to a singer, Pink. Now, I wasn't much of a fan, but there's a song that I relate to. The song goes like this. It says, I'm a hazard to myself. Don't let me get me. I'm my own worst enemy. Now, while today we're talking about the Bible, I think Pink has nailed it perfectly. We are our own worst enemy. That's what Romans 7 is trying to tell us. But the Bible doesn't leave us there. The Bible doesn't leave us without any hope. What it does is it articulates our struggle first for us. It explains to us the nature of our struggle. Once it articulates our struggle, it then moves on to help us understand ways in which we can live with that tension. It's like my good friend, Bob. Bob Larson used to say, he goes, Ben, is this a problem to solve? or a tension to live with. I would put it to you today that Romans 7 is actually 
giving us the struggle, but it's also teaching us how to live with the tension of that struggle as well. So let's go back to Romans 7 now, to our key verses that we've been looking at and unpack the struggle now that we know it is a struggle and look at these three struggles that we find right there in the verses. The first of these is found in Romans 7, 15 to 17. Let's read those now. In verse 15 of Romans 7, it says, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. You see, this is struggle number one. Struggle number one in Romans 7 is to live up to what we know we ought to be. Perhaps you've been talking with a child one day and you ask the child, hey, why did you do that? Why did you break that? Why did you hit your brother like that? Why on earth would you act in that way? And the kid looks at you, I've got two sons, so I know this look, and they look at me and they say, I don't know, I don't know. What Paul is explaining here is courageous, but it's real. It's what some commentators have called the human condition. It's that struggle that we continually fight within ourselves. It's that question we ask, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I go there? Why did I make that deal? Why did I react in that way? Why did I say I would and I didn't? <laughs> Why did I say I wouldn't and I did? Why did I break that promise? Why did, I, why did I continually do what I don't want to do? Why do I always get it back to front? Why do I get on my knees and pray to God and ask Him to help me to never do this again? And then I don't for a while and then after a while I do it again anyway, despite my promises and pleas and despite the pledges that I make that this will be the last time. You see, this is the first struggle that Romans highlights, and we know it because we've all been in that situation. The second one comes from the next few verses in Romans 7, 18 to 20. Let's read those verses now. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want, is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Struggle number two is how we cope with repeated personal failures. Paul is saying here that over and over again, he seems to fall and he seems to struggle and he seems to do things that he's done in the past that he didn't want to do. And here it's happened again. See, that's one of the interesting things about coming to know God, though. The more you get to know God and the more good you see him to be and the more loving and the more compassionate and full of kindness and graciousness and all of his wonderful attributes, it has this funny way of showing you to be worse than you thought yourself to actually be. I've come to realize that as a Christian, it doesn't make me totally immune to temptation or personal failures. In fact, often I'm more aware of my failures and temptations because of how good I know God to be. You know, many people wrestle with these words and they're hard words to wrestle with. It's hard for us to come to grips totally with what Paul is saying in Romans 7. All of us though have to come to grips with our own personal failings. You know, healthy people don't go to doctors, sick people do. And unless we're willing to admit that we have a problem, we're never going to probably seek help for it. That's part of what Romans 7 is trying to get us to realize, that you and I have this part in us that's fighting against us. And if we'll admit it, we can put ourselves on a path to actually overcoming it and getting better. This brings us to the third point, the third struggle that we've got. And that is admitting the true nature of our internal struggle that's going on. And we find this in Romans 7, verses 20 to 24. Let's read those verses now. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? 
And this is struggle number three, admitting the real nature of the war within us. They say that in order to know you have a problem, the first step is admitting it. Most of us have heard this. Paul's point here in Romans 7 is that there are no silver bullets. There are no, there are no magic cures. There isn't some series of words that you can say. What he has told us, however, is that there is a struggle. And the sooner we admit it, the sooner we acknowledge it, and the sooner that we are able to see that it's there, the sooner we'll be able to do something about it. See, that's the wonderful thing about these verses in Romans 7. Paul doesn't leave us just with the struggle. He then comes at the end of this chapter with a wonderful solution to dealing with this struggle that we see inside of ourselves. And we're going to take a closer look now at the final verses of Romans 7 and unpack what that help God offers us looks like. Romans 7 verses 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. In Romans 7, 24 and 25, we see three things that help us as Christians as we deal with the struggle. And the first one is right there in verse 24, and it's honesty. We see this person, Paul here, writing about a situation, honestly admitting the struggle that he has. Honesty is so important if we're ever going to overcome anything, because until we can be honest about ourselves and about the struggles that we have, until we're ready to be honest about our condition, the truth of who we really are, we can't be changed by that. We, we, we won't let the truth get close enough. You know those people who, who you can see, they, the truth is right around them, but they don't want to see it because they're scared if they admitted it, what it might mean for their lives. Well, this is what Romans 7 is telling us. It's telling us a truth about ourselves. But in order for that truth, in order for it to have an impact on us, and in order for us to live in a certain way because of knowing it, we need to admit, we need to be honest about our condition. We need to embrace that and admit that this is who we are so that that truth can have an impact on us so we can let it get close enough to change us. That's the first thing we learn. The second thing we learn from these verses that helps is humility. And notice there's a difference here between honesty and humility. Honesty says, I am a wretched man, but humility says, I cannot save myself. You see, when it comes to the problems in our life, to the sin that the Bible says is there, there's only three options for us and how we're going to cope with it. Number one, we can deny it. We can say that it's not really a thing. We can just say it's not there. Number two, we can try to deal with it ourselves. We can find strategies. We can try harder. We can grit, grit our teeth and clench our fists and white knuckle it and hope that we can get through on our own. There's a lot of people who are trying to do that today. I have tried to do that in my life. But if you have, you'll often know how that ends in frustration. But the third option, and this is the one that the writer here is trying to get across to us. He says, or if you don't want to deny that it exists and you don't want to do it yourself, then the third thing is to admit that because you can't, there is one who can and his name is Jesus Christ. That's the second thing we learn from these verses. And the third thing, of course, we've just said it. It's Jesus Christ. The verses make it clear that there is provision. There's an answer. There's a way. People are looking for a formula. They're looking for a solution. But the solution is not an it. It's a person. It's Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says in Jesus, a way has been made. In Jesus, walking in a moment by moment, spirit-led relationship with him, knowing him, depending on him, leaning on him, and knowing that because you can't do it yourself, you're going to need to rely on him. That's where this is trying to drive us to. You see, there's a reason for this struggle. The struggle is meant to help us rely on the only one who can help us overcome, and that is Jesus. You know, the struggle doesn't mean that you're a bad person. The struggle doesn't mean that, that you're not someone who God could accept. The struggle is there to remind us and to show us that we need to be stripped of all of our self-reliance and place ourselves firmly in his hands. 
In one of my favorite books, it's called Steps to Christ, on page 18, the author writes these words. Let me read them to you now. It is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil and we cannot change them. Education, culture and the exercise of the will, human effort, all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correctness of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within, a new life from above, before men can be changed from sin to holiness. And that power is Christ. I hope as we've talked today, you can see that while we have this broken part inside of us, God has also provided Christ Jesus for us as well. It's not that we need to fight against that broken part and like the pilots of those planes end up nose diving into the ground, but instead take our hands off the controls and give ourselves over to the one who knows how to fix the broken piece in us. Can I pray for you now? Let's pray. Kind and gracious Lord, we thank you today that we can acknowledge that we are broken, Lord, that we have part in us that just doesn't work. Many of us have been fighting it, Lord, and that fight has got us nowhere. Today, we give that peace over to you, that peace of ourselves that, that we can't seem to fight against. And Lord, we ask that you take control. We ask that you, through your inward power in us, through your spirit that you place within us, would give us the power to overcome. We thank you that we can claim this promise today. And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.